Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining the webinar concussion discussion. I'm just going to read you a, a little blurb right now before we get started. The information provided during this webinar reflects the opinions of the speaker only and does not reflect the opinions of Friends Health Connection or the moderator. The information is intended for your general knowledge only only and it's not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment for specific medical conditions. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without consulting with a qualified healthcare provider. Please consult your healthcare provider with any questions or concerns you may have regarding your condition. If you'd like to make a question or make a comment during this discussion, you can use the chat box. And good afternoon, I'm Dr. Jody Radosh, a professor of communications and associate director of the Holleran Center for Community and Global Engagement at Alverna University in Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm a former television reporter and have had, unfortunately, several multiple very bad concussions. Most recently, I had one last summer, and some of my concussions were very disabling, even lasting several years. So I went through a lot of treatment and pain. So I'm very passionate about helping others through their concussions and hope that they can get the help that they need. So that's why I am thrilled to be here today to host this webinar, Concussion Discussion where I get to interview concussion experts and you get to ask them questions as well by typing them in the chat box. So welcome to our show. I am delighted to have such a big name in concussion research, Dr. Dan Engel, who came out with this fabulous book, The Concussion Repair Manual. And Dr. Engel, I must say, your book was a lifesaver this past summer. I had it in my hand almost every single day when I was trying to get through my concussion. And you have quite a background. Your book board certified in both psychiatry and neurology with a clinical practice that combines functional medicine, integrative psychiatry, neurocognitive restoration, and peak performance methods. You're also medical director of Revive Treatment Centers in Colorado, and you also help people with uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, PTSD, and other neurogenitive disorders. So we are just so pleased to have you here, and I just want to say thank you for being here. This is such an honor. So yeah, it's I'd good to be with you. Start with saying, thank you. I just want to start with saying such a hot topic. You know, the movie came out with Will Smith and the word is being passed around quite often. Just the other day, I was going on the highway and there was a big billboard from a, a local hospital that said, you know, leader in concussion treatment. And we use this term, but not we don't really also all of us unknowingly know what a concussion is. I feel like there's a lot of confusion, concussion, traumatic brain injury, and even CTE. Can you just start with clearing some of this up? Yeah, it's a great topic. It is a very lively topic right now. Everything from pro sports to the experiences, walking down the street, flipping on ice and bunking your head. A lot of people, particularly in my medical training 20 years ago, and it's pretty similar still, believe that you have to have a loss of consciousness or you have to black out or pass out in order to have a concussion and that's not true. So concussion is essentially an injury to the brain that significantly impairs neurologic function consistently over time. And then the diagnosis of post-concussive syndrome means that you meet a certain number of criteria and symptoms over a period of time and it continues to last causing significant impairment. So the concussions that most people get, they don't even realize that they had them. Most concussions are mild and they resolve spontaneously. The challenge is when they're not mild and they don't resol resolve spontaneously. Historically, the neurologic field in Western medicine hasn't really known what to do. So when I had my six pretty significant concussions, you and I are about on the same number there. Uh, I told my, I was in my last, severe one was in my neurology training, funny enough. So I told my neurology attending professors, the teaching professors, what was happening with my post-concussive syndrome. And they said, yeah, that's what it sounds like. And we don't really know how to treat it. So go home, get some rest. We hope it gets better. And that wasn't sufficient for me. So I started studying that uh, for about 20, last 20, 25 years and put everything that I could find that was effective for concussion recovery in the book because I, I recognized that people at home needed the information, whether they were going to be able to see a formal physician or not. And again, if they oftentimes see neurology uh, physicians from Western medicine, the treatments aren't very good. We're very good at diagnostics, 
in allopathic neurology, but our therapeutics have been pretty lousy, except in the acute care arena. Like if somebody has severe TBI and they need ICU level care, that's where we're really good. But it's the preventative care that we're not so good at, and it's the chronic care maintenance and support for mild to moderate TBIs that we really don't know much to do with. So hence, we put all of our resources together under the Revive Centers and built out the program that is the most effective that I've come across for treating TBI, concussion, and stroke. Can we talk a little bit about the symptoms? So all four of my concussions were very different. They range from vestibular problems, ocular problems, dizziness, <clears throat> nausea, migraines, and each one uh, had similar treatment, but somewhat different. Can you talk about what you have seen as some of the symptoms for with concussions and how they have ranged. Sure. And I'll loop it back into your first question too, because your question was, what is a concussion? Well, a concussion is when there's a significant trauma to the brain, and it's usually an acceleration or deceleration shearing force that happens. It's not necessarily that the, that the head gets a really strong blow, although that's the most common way that it happens. But many people have concussions from whiplash injury when their head doesn't strike something. It doesn't strike the dashboard or the seat behind them or the windshield. It's this significant change in position where the brain sits inside the skull. And when that's th that change in position is really strong, then it shears the neurons, it shears the meninges, it starts to open up the blood-brain barrier. You get this huge inflammatory cascade, and then that sets in all of the symptoms. And the symptoms are really wide ranging. One of the fascinating things about brain science, and particularly concussion, is that the severity of the injury does not predict the outcome. So some people that have really severe injuries have pretty reasonable, effective, and efficient outcomes in speed to recovery. Some people with mild TBIs have a really hard time. And so there's a lot of different factors. You have to look at the metabolics, people's existing inflammatory load, what their ability to recover is, what their metabolic stress level is. So all of these, when you look at the whole system, we have to take all of it into account. And if somebody has a significant hit or that shearing force and they start to have concussion and post-concussive syndrome, those symptoms look like light noise sensitivity, headaches, dizziness, brain fog, lack of motivation, concentration, mood dysregulation, oftentimes depression, change in sleep habits, um, executive functions being really challenging. So the ability to remember, concentrate, shift, focus, be able to recall, move from one task to another. All of these things are implicated and they're all unique to different people. And so that's why it's really helpful to have a guide or somebody walking a person through this process to identify what their target symptoms are and then put an implementation strategy for treatment in place and then see over time if that strategy is effective or not. Hence, the benefit of having somebody like a coach or a mentor working with somebody at home or coming to a center where that's essentially our specialty. So I agree. I mean, I'm here on the East Coast and my concussion treatment, I went to a concussion center and I could not have done it without a team approach of a neurologist that was there for me, an OT and a PT. And I want you to talk a little bit about some of the treatment, because I think what a lot of us are who have suffered from concussions, we look at medicine and we see that why is there not more research done on concussions? Why does it seem like it's still in its infancy when we have been, you know, sending people to war for years, playing football and, and having head injuries for years, but it seems like there is a little bit of a lack in, and we're just now getting into the research and people are now coming up with really, like, like your book, with these amazing treatments. Yeah, it's another good question. Uh, historically, allopathic medicine, Western medicine, we're really good on the battlefield. We're really good in the operating room. We're really good in the emergency department. We're really good with triage medicine, acute care management. So if somebody has a severe TBI, like one of my TBIs, my traumatic brain injury, that's what that acronym stands for. One of my traumatic brain injuries happened when I dove off a pier, hit a sandbar and cracked my C5, broke my neck. Actually started med school with one of those halos screwed into my skull, oh. which was <laughs> a whole nother story. Oh. And um, the best 
immediate intervention was for me to get stabilized, to go to emergency department, to be assessed for the need for internal fixation or external fixation. I saw the neurologist, I saw the neurosurgeon, I saw the emergency medicine physician. That's where we're really good. And allopathic medicine has been gaining traction in the research arena for therapeutic intervention, not just diagnosis and then stabilization, but also therapeutic and for recovery. Physical therapy is good, occupational therapy is good, uh, movement therapy is good, but generally over the last 20 years since I've been trained in neurology, our therapeutics have been less than optimal. So for me, it was, it was helpful to look outside into the other domains and the other arenas chiropractic medicine, functional neurology, naturopathic medicine, the variety of different osteopathic medicine, um, the variety of different strategies that a lot of other traditional medical fields will implement and utilize for full resolution. And so when we're able to look at how, how many different approaches have found therapeutic benefit, and then we can widen our toolkit and essentially like the buffet of options that we have, then our, the art of medicine becomes how to know when to use which intervention with which client at which time and in which sequence of other interventions. So then it becomes more of a holistic paradigm. And that's what we're seeing with integrative medicine. The entire field of integrative medicine is based on the same core principles. How do we help the body innately heal its own um, injury or its own challenge? How do we wake up the vital force within each person's physiology? How do we intervene with certain therapeutics that create the best benefit with the lowest risk? And how do we step outside of each of our paradigms to see what other orientations and what other paradigms are actually doing that have been beneficial? So my first true mentor was a chiropractic physician, Roger Bell. And I started really learning the art of medicine through him and his presence with clients and the understanding he had with structural integration, functional neurology, and how to actually rehabilitate the nervous system. So that set me on a whole new trajectory. And now I see the benefit is bringing together naturopathic, osteopathic, chiropractic, allopathic, and all these together. And that's essentially what I wanted to do in the book. So it really is a holistic approach. And your book, I want to get into it, talks about some very unique treatments that I, you know, have not really heard before. And some of them are flotation therapy, um, laser therapy, hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about them and, and how their success rate and how you came to realize that these were good treatments for traumatic brain injuries? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll take them in the level of priority with appreciation in the allopathic arena. And when I say allopathic, that's your general Western physician, MD, uh, versus chiropractic, DC, naturopathic, ND, osteopathic, DO. So with MDs um, and the allopathic neurologic research, there's more and more appreciated research for the, the valid therapeutic use of hyperbaric oxygen. And that's pretty new, particularly for concussion and stroke. It's only in the last few years that that's started to gain a lot more traction. And there's a lot of differences about, do you, do you have to use a hard shell versus a soft shell? What pressure variables, variable pressure settings, how many treatments, how long a session goes, how deep do you dive a person? And what I mean by dive, it means like how much um, atmospheric pressure is the oxygen in the chamber? And all of that being said, the data is showing more and more benefit. And what does, hyper, what does hyperbaric oxygen do? It hypersaturates the tissues, not just the, the areas of injury, but the cellular matrix itself. And when you hypersaturate the tissues with oxygen, you're providing a necessary part of the therapeutic healing potential. Now, all medicines have their place in their sweet spot, so to speak, in the dose curve. If you don't use enough, there's no effect. If you use too much, it's poisonous or it becomes detrimental. Same thing with oxygen. Same thing with water. Same thing with sunlight. Same thing with food. Same thing with everything. Everything has its therapeutic potential. So if you use too much oxygen, you can create oxidative stress. 
So any one of these tools, if we tried to drive it as a single intervention, is when you have side effects. And that's part of the reason that pharmaceutical medicine is challenged in many ways. Many of our pharmaceuticals come from natural herbs and substances in nature, and then we extract that primary ingredient. We um, catapult that primary ingredient as the, as the only driving force to the exclusion of how nature came up with all of the other associated alkaloids and botanicals for that primary ingredient to be able to work well. But when we do that, when we take out, extract one thing, and we use only that at high doses when you get side effects. So the same thing with any of these interventions, low-level low laser therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, flotation therapy. Although I'm not so sure about flotation therapy, whether that's true or not, because flotation therapy seems to work for everybody. At worst, it's net neutral. And the reason that it works is it's one of the most effective tools at resetting the neuroendocrine system, the connection between the brain and the rest of the hormones or the glands. And one of the reasons is, is it's so effective in helping people get into parasympathetic tone. And most people, when they're injured or stressed, they're in sympathetic tone, right? So the nervous system has two primary avenues, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight, stress, like get into action, get motivated. We got work to do super helpful, necessary, but we tend to drive too much stress on a low level chronic state now. And so much of the benefit in the therapeutic is helping people shift over to parasympathetic tone. One of the best ways to do that is in the float tank. The first time since conception that people are without environmental stimuli. There's no sight, no sound, no gravity, no proprioception. Most of what the brain is tracking now goes a bit quiet and all of the subconscious material can come up onto the main screen. So people now are like realizing how busy their minds are. But it's also really therapeutic because it's a dark, quiet, nurturing environment. So it's incredibly effective immediately post-concussion. Because with the light, noise, sound sensitivity, you need to really have an insulated experience where the nervous system is able to go a little quiet, a little less stimulated, so it can start to heal and re rehabilitate. Um, over time, people do a stack of floats. It starts to uh, improve endogenous opioid production, which means your own body's ability to produce um, pain-relieving chemicals and neuropeptides. We can get, I, I geek out on flotation therapy. It's one of the things I like the most because everybody can do it. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, on medications, not, healthy, not, everybody can get in a tank. The only people that told me they can't get in a tank are the people with anxiety or panic or claustrophobia. And I say, great even better because I've had a lot of people, clients, friends, and family who are being able to cure, not just improve, but cure anxiety, panic attack, and claustrophobia by getting in the tank on a regular basis over time. And there's a whole coaching strategy around how to do that. But just to say, I haven't seen any contraindications to float therapy. Uh, Transcranial magnetic stimulation, you mentioned, it essentially helps cellular activation and um, messaging uh, throughout these targeted areas, particularly if we know through the functional exam or on scan where the lesion in the brain is or where the trauma foci or focal point is, then we put the magnet right there and it starts to help rehabilitate the cellular signaling through these deep pulsed magnetic impulses. And then you mentioned uh, low-level laser therapy. Low-level laser therapy essentially helps produce ATP production, um, stimulates the photoreceptors that have this long cascade in neurooptimization, improving, improving inflammation. This has been well documented. All the, the four treatments that you just asked, they all have deep documentation. Now, there might be some people that say it's not done in a double by procedure controlled trial and all of that. And I say, well, that may be true. But I look at, I tend to, in some arenas, I tend to be more of an experiential engineer than the pure research scientist, because I wanna know, and you'll see this from the book, I wanna know what are the therapies that work that when we stack them together have the best chance for success. And yes, people have to appreciate, are these therapies available? How much do they cost? There's time commitment, et cetera. And not everything, just because if you have a lot of ingredients, like if you're cooking, if you put all those ingredients into a pot, it doesn't mean you're gonna make a beautiful recipe. So the art is knowing when to use what therapy at which time. 
but I tend not but and I tend to look at the associated therapies that have the best chance of working well together and then accelerate people's response rate um, as efficiently and effectively and safely as we can. And that's essentially what we do at Revive Therapy or Revive Treatment Centers. I haven't seen another treatment center have the same efficacy rates as we do. Um, that's not a sales pitch. That's just data. And we're really good at helping the brain recover because we put a whole suite of these services into people's baseline therapeutic regimen while we're looking at functional neurology, while we're looking at a integrative medicine kind of platform, looking at people's metabolics. So what does their gut process look like? What does their immune system uh, look like? What do their hormones look like in the midst of everything else? So I use the acronym GENI, G-E-N-I, which stands for gut, endocrine, neuro, immuno, and then emotional or the psycho-emotional landscape. Because people with traumatic brain injuries and concussions oftentimes have trauma associated with it. And we need to understand the psychology that's related to trauma. And what's the psychology related to the optimal mindset for recovery? Because we know this, what's happening in here, it has a huge predictive effect. How I feel about my injury, how I feel about my life, how I'm orienting to making meaning out of this. How do I continue to bring myself towards a sense of in moving from pessimism to a sense of possibility and what can this potentially be doing for me but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of the grief that has to be metabolized too if people have lost a lot of function we work with a lot of vets who have been you know essentially blown up 10 or 100 times through these really interesting or actually horribly detrimental but when you're looking at it from a scientific standpoint it's kind of interesting something called blast induced neurotrauma when these intermittent explosive devices go off, it's not just one injury, it's like a thousand really high frequency, high oscillation injuries that rattle the brain really quickly. That's a very unique subset of TBI and concussion and why veterans have PTSD. So when we look at all of the ways that we can bring into a therapeutic orientation, and then to be able to track symptoms over time, because we have to know interventions if they're working or not. And so that's why it's helpful to have like some kind of tracking or data collection process. What are you using? Is it working? And if not, then try something else on a buffet and, and keep going. And that's actually a great segue because your book includes two parts. The first part talks about all these treatments, but the second part of the book is more like a workbook that you can use to track your own progress. So do you think, can someone who has a concussion try these treatments or do they, by themselves, is there any um, harm in doing that? Or do they need to go to a physician to walk them through this process? Can they just use your book as a manual? Many people have used the book as a manual and had great success. Um, one of the challenges though, <laughs> it, it, it's inherently built into the experience of the injury, is when you have a brain injury, it's hard to track. It's hard to self-observe, it's hard to organize, it's hard to follow through, it's hard to make a plan, it's hard to stick mm -hmm. with a plan. It's where it's really important to have a coach, a mentor, some kind of strategist, it's kind of like really solid support system to go through it. So I launched a program called the uh, BOLD or the Brain Optimization and Lifestyle Design. And we did the beta test on it last fall, had a greater than 50% recovery rate in post-concussive syndromes in, in a six week period at home, which was pretty phenomenal for an at home program. But what we did is it was, it was set in the container of a webinar series where we had ongoing coaching and mentorship support through it. And we, and we focused on four basic um, uh, parts of the puzzle, so to speak. Diet, movement, oxygenation, and frequency technologies. And so what I mean by diet is what are people's dietary strategies? Are they eating a brain optimization diet? or a recovery acceleration diet, going from the standard American diet, the SAD diet, to a recovery acceleration diet, or the RAD diet. I tend to geek out on acronyms. So we're trying to move people from a SAD state to a RAD state. And there's a whole suite of kind of interventions when we're looking at movement therapeutics, oxygenation and breathing strategies, and then frequency technologies, like for example, one of which you mentioned, or two of which you mentioned were low-level laser therapy, 
um, and um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a form of pulse electromagnetic frequency, and that's a style of or a subset of direct current stimulation. All these frequency technologies have their place, and not all of them are effective for each person. So when we broke it down and we, and we had an at-home strategy that was easy to follow and people that were able to call in with questions and, and asks about, you know, this is working or this, I tried this, this didn't work, what did you suggest? Um, then we were able to see a really significant acceleration in people's recovery rates. And oftentimes, particularly with head injury, uh, people suffer in silence and they suffer alone. And they need to just know that they're a part of a community of other people going through the process that there are strategies, everything can be healed. So this is so much about infusing optim, um, optimism just into the mind state. Because some people have been dealing with TBI and concussion symptoms for decades, and there are ways to heal it. We've seen people with, with PCS for decades get significantly better. You just have to know what the program is and how to stay with it and stick to it. So you feel like even though if they're very bad symptoms that they can eventually resolve if they know how to treat them. Is that, that sounds like what you're kind of saying, yes. which is really very hopeful for so many. And let's talk a little bit about diet. I think that's something that's, there's some literature out there. You talk about it in the book as well. Are there certain foods that help the recovery of people that are having traumatic brain injuries? Yes, definitely. Um, before I go into that, I just want to say one more thing. I don't want to I also am a realist, and okay. you know, if somebody had a transected spinal cord through a severely okay. horrific accident, historically we wouldn't be able to repair that. You know, if somebody was a quadriplegic with a transected cord, that would be hard to repair. But there is more and more new science that shows recovery is possible. There's more and more therapeutic interventions. Um, one of the more cutting edge technologies that I've come across and utilized for myself to fully heal my concussions and PCS is stem cell therapy, intranasal stem cell therapy, IV stem cell therapy, local stem cell therapy, as well as um, electrical stimulation to the cord and the transected uh, level itself. So I don't want to give people false hope. You know, if there's a severe neurologic insult, do I believe everything is healable? Absolutely. There is a documentation of everything being healed that we can imagine. If we just know where to look, know how far back in the archives to go, everything's been healed. So, so much of it is about learning to find meaning in it. I'm a huge fan of man, um, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning because he just gives such a good account of going through a horrific experience and finding meaning in it. And for me, that is when I've seen people go from consistently having such a detrimental or such a disabling condition, such a challenge with their therapeutic process, when they're able to shift their faith into something meaningful, then I see them optimize. It's that one turning point. That's all mindset. More than we talk about food and supplementation and other therapeutics, the mindset for me is the biggest turning point. Yeah. And so I just want to stress that and give, give a lot of thought and consideration to that. I've certainly been on the receiving end of that personally going through my own experiences and then seeing that with hundreds and hundreds of clients going through the same process. So that being said, then I'll get to your question, food, which is a really good one. Uh, we know that going towards a ketogenic diet, more fat, optimized protein, less carbohydrates, tends to be more effective. Going towards an anti-inflammatory diet, so there's a huge movement in the like paleo, um, uh, like performance and dietary lifestyle um, management to show optimization in cognitive performance, physical performance, emotional performance, life performance. Now, paleolithic dietary strategies can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But what I generally mean is eating close to nature with as little processed food as possible, eating local, eating seasonal, eating organic, ideally knowing where your food is coming from, shopping in the outer aisles versus the middle aisles, the outer aisles being like where the fresh produce is, where your fresh meats are, mm. um, where your fresh nuts and seeds. And if you do optimize for grains, what those are like versus the processed foods are all in the middle aisles. 
So when we just move in that direction, we see more and more benefit. Uh, a good friend of mine also wrote a book, How to Feed a Brain, which is another great resource for people healing from concussion on just the necessary strategies for optimizing dietary approach while decreasing the inflammatory load. And his name's Kevin Ballister. He's got a phenomenal um, backstory of healing his own concussion after he fell like 30 feet onto concrete and was in a coma and had to learn how to eat again and walk again and write again. Phenomenal story, great guy. And his book is good. It's very direct. It's very like just the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of it. So there's a, there's a chapter in the concussion repair manual on food. Um, and I talk a lot about the ketogenic approach. Intermittent fasting can also be helpful immediately post-concussion because it decreases the inflammatory load. And optimizing for looking at the, the whole position for tr transforming somebody's dietary strategy. So my last concussion is when I completely turned the corner into an optimized diet. I'd been eating really crummy, and I, and I started to appreciate the fact that my brain felt better when I started eating better. And if I, intermittent fasting can mean a lot of different things too, but for me, what it meant was essentially a time-restricted window. And so I eat in about an eight to 10 hour window and I fast for the rest of the 12 to 14 hours, especially immediately post-concussion. And so that tends to work significantly well for people over time. But diet's a unique one because we get attached to our our comforts and the things that we like, like sugar. What are the worst things for the for the brain? Alcohol and sugar. Not so good. Interestingly enough, some of the best things for the brain are like coffee and nicotine. I don't mean nicotine in the way people smoke it because the way we have the way we use tobacco is horrible. All the carcinogens that are laced in tobacco, but tobacco, nicotine, tobacco has nicotine in it. Nicotine stimulates nicotine adenodinucleotide that stimulates cellular energy. So there's a whole movement now in integrative functional medicine around NAD injections or oral supplementation. We've seen phenomenal results in NAD, IV and injection therapy at helping people cure um, acute and even chronic PCS or post-concussive syndrome. Coffee is amazing for the brain too. It just happens to be acidic and it's hard on people's adrenals. But it, there's, there's, there's a reason like the classic scientists and artists are drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes because they're really good for the brain. They turn the brain on. They're just not so good for the rest of the body unless you're using them in an optimized way. That's so interesting. Very fascinating. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when you explain it and it's eat healthy. Um, the whole point with coffee and also nicotine is, is just, it's fascinating. I just want to get to some of the questions that we have from some of our viewers that are watching. And one of them, I'm going to turn our conversation a little bit to children and concussions. So a lot of people, parents out there are having their youngsters play sports and often they get concussions and are worried about the long-term effects. Is there anything that you want to talk about with children and concussions? And, you know, should parents be allowing their kids to play soccer and football? Do you have any strong feelings on these, on these things? Or, I do, you know, we think I, we I do have the strong NFL. feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I have, yeah, I do have strong feelings. Part of it is because I played competitive soccer for 22 years and my half of my concussions were from soccer. And when I looked at my spec scan and I showed one of my um, colleagues who had been running uh, neuroscience, this was several years ago, uh, he was running an organization where they were doing spec scans and they had done 100,000 scans and he had seen 20,000 of them. He said, wow, I've never seen a brain look that bad perform as good as yours. Wow. So what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing all these things that I put in the manual. And he said, well, keep it up. It looked, you know, you, functionally you look great, but your brain still has a lot of challenge. So that's when I, want, I went even deeper into hyperbaric oxygen, low-level laser theory, therapy, transcranial magnetics, and stem cells. Once I started doing those on a regular basis, it really started to accelerate everything. But coming back to the passion piece, I'm a huge passion driver and cheerleader for sports. It was one of the things that really helped me identify with my peer group and my tribe. It helped me get off the streets. I probably would have ended up dead or in jail had I not played soccer for 22 years. 
And it was also really hard on my brain. And we're appreciating more and more the chronic implications of frontal head traumas. So my position, heading the soccer ball 10 to 12 times a game for 22 years is something like 25,000 head, heads to the um, ball. And when you're – another fascinating kind of just mm, sports data point is that boxers, if they're slugged in the face in the middle of a ring, it's like 20 pounds of pressure to the brain. Soccer players, if you go to head a full volley, which many do, particularly in a defensive position, it's 70 pounds of pressure to the brain. So it's something like three and a half times the force of getting slugged as heading a soccer ball. And you don't typically think that. So parents typically think soccer is safer than football. Not necessarily. So there's a huge movement in youth athletics and youth soccer to eliminate headers from youth soccer. Probably not going to do it at the college level. Probably not going to do it at the professional level because there's too much on at stake in the game. Same thing with youth in football. There's a huge movement from tackle football to flat football. Do I think those are better? Absolutely. Do I think they're safer? Absolutely. Do I think they can still get the benefit, the social benefit, and the bonding, and the personality kind of construct from playing that style? For sure. So when I talk to parents, I say, yes, optimize to flag football. Optimize to a no-header soccer orientation or a league. We need to be thinking about that long term. Because the long-term implications of people that have been in the NFL and even pro soccer is, yes, they have problems with executive functioning, memory, attention, focus, concentration, mood dysregulation, chronic pain, needing to be on pharmaceuticals to address all of those symptoms and therefore having a whole lot of side effects over time. So I get excited about that. You know, for example, I'm in a hotel room in Steamboat Springs right now snowboarding. My last major concussion was getting turned upside down in a snowboard park. I put an eight-inch crack in the back of my helmet, and I just heard this internal voice say, you just crossed the line. And sure enough, I started having post-concussive syndrome really severely, and that's what sent me down this track. So do I ride as aggressively as I used to? No. But I'm a proponent, too, that we're, that we're still here to live our lives, and we're still here to do the things that really turn us on and really light us up and really – Find, you know, help us find the excitement for life and the appreciation because life goes by super fast, so fast. And so if somebody's dealing with debilitating symptoms for years and years, I'm a, usually a huge proponent for saying find somebody who's going to help you with this issue now. Do whatever it takes to get better so that you, we don't just like get by in life. We're actually able to optimize in life. Now, can everybody come to our center at Revive? Probably not because of time, energy, resources, et cetera. But what, what can you do at home? Who can you find at home? And do as much as you're able to do at home. And then if you do come to our center, that means you already have a solid foundation. That means you don't have to work from scratch. And when people have been doing everything, a lot of times people come into our clinic and they're like, I've done everything in your book. It worked for a while, but then it hit a plateau. And I'm like, so good you did that. Because now we can help you go from good to great. And so we want to continue to accelerate people's experience. And yes, what, do, what are the things, well, this is one of your other questions, what are the um, risk factors for TBI? And what are also the things that help people uh, mitigate or avoid the experience of a concussion if they've had a head injury? So the risk factors for TBI is that people are already inflamed. They already have a high... Um, stress load, they're already um, challenged in their metabolic capacity, which means like how much they can do before they have symptoms of feeling fatigued or sick or people's immune system, if their immune system is weak, that predicts towards having something like PCS. If they've had previous head injury, that predicts to having PCS because previous head injury predicts a worse head injury in the future unless people have totally revamped their lifestyle. So risk factors are like people with adventurous spirits that you know, aren't really mindful of the potential ramifications. That was me you know, through most of my childhood and, and adulthood. So it's really helping to people you know, to, I work with a lot of athletes and these guys are always bonking their heads. And so we're talking a lot of strategy around how do you put yourself in the game, but consistently, Make sure that you're at least trying to 
toggle your avoidance of an injury. And the things that protect people, people from injury, actually having a stronger neck so the, the head doesn't wobble around as much, um, being on fish oil, CBD is, go, is good as a therapeutic and a preventative. That stands for cannabidiol or the non-psychoactive uh, medical component of marijuana. We use that a lot at our clinic because it's so good at decreasing inflammation while not altering people's cognition at all. And CBD is legal in all 50 states. So there's a lot of different things. And, and I know we only have a little bit of time. We could unpack this conversation for days and maybe we will continue in the future. But as far as just looping it back around to the mindset, yes, we need to be aware of the injury potential in the sports that we're engaged in and the lifestyle that we're managing. We also want to be able to continue to optimize towards the things that we enjoy. For me, I had to make a big choice in stopping alcohol through a series of head injuries. And, and there was a huge social like cohesion that happened with drinking with my friends in the past. And when I realized that it put me in situations where I wasn't as aware. And also when I had a head injury, it made it harder for me to recover. I had to change that whole orientation and that led me to changing my entire social network. And it also led me into a whole other series of optimized strategies for getting in touch with who I am and what I'm here to do. Alcohol tends to be a depressant. It tends to be a social lubricant, but it also tends to depress people over time. It's very addictive. It's also poisonous to the brain. So. Coming back to the, the parent kind of question, mm -hmm. I always encourage people to be a part of a community and you're building community and I love that. Being a part of a community where you can get some of these questions and, and supports and know that you're not trying to navigate all of this in isolation or without some kind of guide that's helping you um, along the way. So, such a great points there, and uh, you brought up a lot of them. One of the things that I think is interesting, um, my last concussion, I just got hit by a closet door and it threw me into a concussion. So, you know, sometimes they're not sports injuries that also, you know, people, of course, you know, car accidents, falls, or also people obtain concussions. You know, I, I love your uh, mantra to just live your life and life is short. But I will say I get really scared and afraid about ha having another concussion. Is there, and I'm sure I'm not alone, are there, you know, things, helmets out there or things that people can do to kind of protect themselves from you know, obtaining another traumatic brain injury? Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, and I'm glad you brought it up because I also don't want to be so cavalier and just tell people go out and live your life. There is a, a, something about spatial awareness. And so if you've had a previous head injury, it can really affect your, your eye gaze and tracking, your ability to converge and diverge and have more of a peripheral awareness. Mm -hmm. I had a, a, um, a spinal lengthening treatment, a de the decompressive treatment done by a therapist once. And after that, I appreciated how much I was not fully taking in my entire peripheral vision. It was immediate. And had I not had that, I don't know that I would have the same emphasis. There's, so there's something to be said about having more of our awareness in time and space. That being said, in addition to being able to know where you are and potentially be able to predict or at least be able to track, like a, a really good friend of mine, she had a pretty bad concussion when she rose up and hit her the top of her head on the, on the edge of a... Uh, desk or a corner and that's another good example like with more spatial mm -hmm. awareness or more tracking and concentration maybe she would have remembered that that was there yeah or you know if if <laughs> if you're like sometimes one thing one time I woke up in the middle of the night had to go to the bathroom I realized that maybe the door was open so I had my hands out in front of me but the door was straight on and so I just walked into the edge of it and so there's going to be random things that happen. So what do we do when random things happen? Well, we get onto an anti-inflammatory diet as soon as possible. We'll take a bunch of fish oil, take a bunch of CBD, get into a float tank. All of that will decompress the injury. So there's not as much trauma residue and there's not as much neurologic residue. A lot of um, practitioners I know that will stress just the neurologic recovery or just the endocrinological recovery or just the gut brain access 
All of those are important, but if we're not talking about the psychology and the trauma of it as well, the avoidance and the kind of the hyper startle reflex, when you look at PTSD, PTSD significantly happens after people have a severe concussion or a traumatic brain injury. Look at a lot of our vets. So I'm constantly asking people to look at the whole picture and how do we do that and live our life? Well, ideally, if you're able to get a neurological exam, then you can tell how well your eyes are tracking. Are you seeing your whole periphery? What is your concentration, memory, attention, and focus? What are the executive functions looking like? And then when that happens, make sure that there's no trauma that's holding back because trauma can predict more trauma. If we're living in a traumatized state, then everything that we experience, we're, we're filtering that through a trauma lens, right? So mm-hmm. the, the hypersensitivity, and I've seen this a lot with our, myself too for a while. Yeah. My, my lady can attest to this. I had a heart hyperstartle response every time something just knocked my brain even slightly. And it was really frustrating, really tweaky for my nervous system. And I just had to really start with visualization and trauma resolution and really appreciating the fact that I still had a lot of trauma related to all my injuries. Yeah. So that's just a, it's an important thing to think about and at least contemplate. Absolutely. Very good points. My worst concussion was when I was cleaning out a refrigerator and I hit the top. And I think you're right. There is something with the spatial relations and knowing your parameters and where you are. And I do think that gets off um, from traumatic brain injuries. I, uh, many times, though, though, I really would wish there was like a magic pill I could take, something that would, I'm sure many others do too, that would make me better in an instant. And you talk about some supplements. You also talked about some other things to take. But are there any medications that could help Um, help people get better faster. There is some talk sometimes about antidepressants and is there any kind of scientific or medical research behind taking medications to help your concussion treatment? Yeah, the the pharmaceutical interventions tend to be symptom specific. So for example, aniracetam and piracetam are really good nootropics. They're they're typically, historically they're pharmaceutical grade, but you can buy them over the internet. And they're, what nootropics do is they help with cognitive performance. They help the brain perform better. So people are usually using that if they're having trouble with concentration, attention, focus, memory, et cetera. Those can be supportive. And still yet, they're not as rehabilitative as something that potentially could be like the natural food-based supplements that I've seen that are super helpful, like fish oil. We already mentioned fish oil. Uh, lecithin, that, which has a lot of phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, those are the cellular membrane nutrients that help things move in and out of the cell really well. Um, there are other herbs that are really good for attention, focus, concentration, and memory, like bacopa, um, gota cola, um, huperzine. Um, some of the food-based antioxidants are really helpful as well. Um, these are your oftentimes bright colored berries and fruits and the healthy phytocyanidins and the uh, uh, phytonutrients and the botanicals that help the brain itself move more into a recovery mode and accelerate its healing potential. There's a lot of different um, programs and protocols supplementation stacks, so to speak, on the market now. And because everybody is unique and because an injury doesn't predict the resolution, I tend to say, if you get drawn to one, try one, see if it works, track it over time. If it doesn't move on to another one. I'm a big fan of cognitive enhancement and performers. And um, there are some really, for example, like Alpha Brain from Onnit is one of the only supplements, if not the only supplement that I know that helps people with ver- verbal and spatial working memory. Mm-hmm. And that was proven in clinical trials. So it's also helpful to know what's hype and what's actually effective. And so when we are able to put things in a series together, and again, if we know that there are certain pharmaceuticals that work to address certain symptoms, are we also not only addressing those symptoms, but we're addressing the causative factor. And sometimes those causative factors, for example, if we're talking about like allopathic intervention, stem cell therapies, one of the leading tools right now, because it really does rehabilitate the causative factor. 
it's one of the few things that are going to be able to help the um, neuronal cell population expand and really help new neuronal cell growth, not just synaptogenesis or like all the connections between neurons, which is also important, but actually neuronal load and neuronal recovery and being able to rehabilitate injured neurons. Stem cells are one of the few things that can actually do that. So there's a lot more happening. You know, I think it was time or discovery said that, you know, this last decade has been like the decade of the brain where we're learning so much about neuroscience and cognitive science. And I think we're only going to continue to do that. And we're going to understand how the things that help heal the brain are oftentimes the same things that help optimize the brain and vice versa. We just tweak the variables. Sometimes we use a higher intensity if we're healing the brain versus just moving an optimization from good to great. You may need more of an acute care process and then move more into a maintenance kind of process. So all of these things get me really excited about what lies ahead. And I know our brain age is, is correlative with our longevity and our physiologic age. So when our brain is younger and more vital and more excited and more turned on and more healed from old injuries, then we continue to live our lives in the best way that we can. And it looks like there's a lot more research that's being done, as you mentioned. A Temple University just came out with a concussion center where they're doing a lot more research and other uh, universities are, are also jumping on that as well. Where do you think the research needs to go? What else needs to be done right now? I get really curious about when we move into more, we, when I say we, I mean we as a medical system. When we continue to move more and more into an integrative medical approach, an integrative medical paradigm, we tend to, in allopathic medicine, reductionalistically look at every specific variable, which is helpful, absolutely, to see how effective this one variable is. But we can't separate the mind from the body, and we can't separate a symptom from causality. And we can't separate one organ system from another. So we have to look at the entire system. We have to look at what people's metabolics are and their immune system and their, their gut. And, you know, it's like we were talking about before. When people have bad head injuries, oftentimes the master glands are off and they can't tell the rest of the brain how to work. So the pituitary, pineal, and hypothalamus get significantly affected. And so I might look like I'm hypothyroid or... I've got hypogonadism, like my ovaries are low or my testes are low, like my hormones are low, but it might be because the issue is a central issue, not a peripheral issue. So all of these strategies, when we have more and more of an integrative approach, I get more and more excited about our opportunity. And I also am a huge proponent of mindset and the psychiatric opportunity or the psychologic optimization opportunity. I train in psychiatry. I think psychiatry has its place, particularly if people are floridly manic or psychotic, but I think psychiatry is a really challenged field. And I tend to speak a lot about the integrative psychiatric aspects. And what, is, what, is the, what are the variety of different ways that we can help people get turned on to who they are and what they're here to do? And actually live an optimized life from a place of abundance as, a place, as opposed to a place of scarcity. And when we start to make these healing therapeutic paradigms and centers available to everybody, then I think we're really going to accelerate our healing as a culture, not just individual silos, because we're all connected. We have this division between mind and body. We have this division between me and we. We have this division between like religion and spirituality. What is, what is an experience of existential, experiential spirituality look like? And how do you infuse spirituality into the recovery process? And I'm not talking about like from a religious perspective or a dogmatic perspective. I'm, I'm talking about helping people get in touch with their sense of their own experience with the divine and how much that has a therapeutic benefit. I've consistently seen that that significantly up levels people's experience in healing but also their lives in general and I don't pretend to know what that is for everybody but I certainly get curious about the question and I ask people to ask that question for themselves and don't just settle for anybody telling them what they should be able to do or, or limit their own beliefs 
based on a particular paradigm or dogma that they were adopted into. We have the opportunity in this one precious life to expand our horizons, move beyond our limitations, and have a life better than imagined. And oftentimes, the trauma is just the window into reconceptualizing a, a more aware and conscious relationship with life. It certainly was that for me. Like, my head injuries are actually my doorway to waking up. And, you know, there's this fascinating, I shared this in the book in the beginning of the uh, introduction. There's this, I've studied with traditional cultures and um, plant teachers from around the world. And in some cultures, when the teacher sees that the student's ready, he'll club the student on the top of the head to open up the crown. And so you could say, is that to induce a traumatic brain injury? I don't think so. I think it's in order to expand someone's opportunity to go through a rites of passage into the next version of themselves. So usually the crisis is the platform for transformation. Crisis precedes transformation every time. Some people experience it through TBI, addiction, depression, anxiety, cancer, the list goes on. It's always an opportunity for us to get more clear on who we are. How do we actually choose to experience this process? How can I find any semblance of meaning? How can I use it to become a better person? Not only for myself, but for the, the collective. Because we're in a pretty dynamic time on the planet right now. And we're getting called into action. And so much of the recovery process is becoming fit for service so that we can serve the, the movement moving forward. This whole transformational medicine, we didn't really get into this, but this is the cutting edge. This is where medicine's going. It's gone from allopathic, just kind of like Western medicine, into integrative medicine, which has been definitely an improvement. And now we're going into transformational medicine. People actually coming to healing centers to have transformational experiences, to get more connected to what they're actually here to serve and how they can do that in the best way. Wow. I, so it definitely is more of a holistic approach that we're seeing. And I think it's your unique background being board certified in neurology and psychiatry that you really come at this looking at this holistic approach, how not just to heal the mind, but heal the body as well through traumatic brain injuries. And I thank you so much for your time. We could talk all day. Unfortunately, we are. That hour went by so quickly. And I really apologize to a few people that posted questions, um, maybe in a split second. One question real quick was about how long people should start to worry about concussions after, after how long the symptoms are, are lasting. Should they start to worry? There was a quick qu uh, question that was posted. Oh, uh, yeah. Symptoms. Symptoms should resolve within seven to 10 days Okay. if they're going to resolve spontaneously. Now, that doesn't mean that people that have had symptoms for weeks and months can't have resolution, but it usually means that they need to do more and change more in their lifestyle in order to have that resolution. They need to change their diet. They need to get sleeping better. Sleep's a huge one. We didn't even talk much about that um, yes. because sleep is when the nervous system actually repairs and rehabilitates, particularly between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. And so sleep, diet, movement, again, optimization, okay. getting into uh, a creative process or an expanded state of awareness. Um, if you, you know, Mother Teresa was fond of saying, if you're feeling lousy, go help somebody. It'll help you feel yeah. better. And it's totally true. Like get into service. Even if I'm feeling less than optimal, I can still serve in some kind of good way. Well, I think you're helping a lot of people that are going through traumatic brain injuries. I have a copy of your book right here, The Concussion Repair Manual. How can people get their own copy of the book? Yeah, great, great question. Thanks for asking. Um, the website's probably the easiest, concussionrepairmanual.com. And then they can also find me through drdaneagle.com and our center, which is revivecenters.com. Dr. Engel, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. You're doing great work in concussion research and treatment, and I just really appreciate your time, and, and I'm just I'm in awe of all the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. It's great to be with you, Jody. Yeah, keep up the good work yourself. We'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye.